thinner and brighter than I am now. And so I was a bit bold. And so I sort of said things like, well, could there be an uncharacterized photoreceptor within the eye, different from the rods and cones? This great boyish enthusiasm burst out. And it was met with the most extraordinary opposition, which is summarized in the next slide. <laughs> you have no idea. There was one talk I was giving in the early days at a big meeting, big vision meeting in, in the United States. And somebody at the back actually stood up and said, bullshit, and walked out. I mean, it was nasty stuff. Um, the trouble is, with these early experiments, they sort of had a point. We hadn't done the definitive experiment. Because remember that mouse I showed you? I removed all of its rods and most of its cones, but there were a few nasty degenerate cones left. And they said, well, it's a very simple task, so what they're doing is using these degenerate cones to regulate a very simple light response. Didn't make sense at lots of levels, however, it's the thing that haunted us for about eight years. Until we engineered a mouse. We engineered a mouse in which all of the rods and cones were genetically ablated. And in these two back-to-back -back science papers, we showed that circadian responses were perfectly preserved. So here we have the ability to regulate the clock by light, and shift the clock by light. This is an animal with no rods and cones, and this is the wild type. They are statistically indistinguishable. There's another photoreceptor within the mammalian eye. If it's not the rods and cones, then what the hell is it? And this led to this is a very powerful model. And this led to, the, to, 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 again, a lot of work. But in short, what we showed is that a small number of those ganglion cells, those cells that form the optic nerve, about one in a hundred is directly light sensitive. They're called photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. They use a new light sensitive molecule that hadn't been discovered before, peaking in the blue part of the spectrum. So we were right. Deeply, deeply satisfying, I have to say. Um, there's another receptor within the eye. The eye is doing two fundamentally different things. It's grabbing light to make an image. And it's also grabbing light to regulate internal time. This is what the cells look like. Um, Steve Hughes and the lab took this picture for me. It's, it's so beautiful. Well, of course, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's read that article that, that Mimi organized. What's your favorite neuron? Well, th th this, is, this is my favorite neuron. Um, and, and what they do, of course, this is looking at, at, at a big chunk of the eye, the retina, and you see these individual neurons, and their fibers are light sensitive. So what you've got is this great photosensitive net that encompasses broad arcs of the eye. This is all mice. What about humans? And this is where I think the data gets really interesting. Very difficult to study. However, we identified an 88-year-old patient with an unknown disease of her rods and cones, such that her rods and cones had degenerated, and rather than this healthy-looking eye, she had an eye that looked like that. And working with my clinical colleagues, it became clear that this individual had absolutely no conscious light perception whatsoever. And we then asked her, would she mind taking part in some experiments, would look at her ability to regulate her clock, and to our intense pleasure, look at this. These data are just amazing. Here's her rest activity profile. This is when she's active during the day. This is when she's inactive at night. And even her hormonal profiles were peaking at the right time of the day. No vision, and yet these cells were intact and regulating her internal clock. Now, this actually relates to some quite important new work. Visual blindness, of course, need not result in the loss of all light detection by the eye. But sleep and 24-hour abnormalities are essentially ignored in clinical ophthalmology. And that's where we've had the advantage in Oxford of working very closely with my clinical colleagues in the Oxford Eye Hospital, particularly Susie Downs. So my department has been working with the Eye Hospital, and I'll cut a long story short and summarise in these few slides. Of course, visual blindness need not mean complete blindness. So in many conditions where the rods and cones have been lost, such as age-related macular degeneration, Leber's congenital amaurosis, or choroideremia, these individuals have their photosensitive ganglion cells. They're still there. But until recently, they were ignored. And now such individuals are being encouraged to expose their eyes to sufficient daytime light to maintain normal circadian regulation. They're not being told to cover up their glasses and hide their unsightly eyes from light, they're encouraged to regulate their clocks. Very, very important. And it's actually a little bit more profound than that. 
because there has been a tendency in the past to say, well, you can't see with these eyes. You can't see to look after them, so they're a source of infection. They're no use to you. Let's just pop them out and put a glass one in. And of course, then what you've done without realising it is plunge an, plunge an individual, they're already blind, and then you plunge them into a world which is effectively unremitting jet lag for the rest of their lives, unwittingly so. So this is important stuff that's now getting into the clinical departments. In the same way, of course, we've talked about loss of the rods and cones, but there are diseases where the inner retina is lost. So those ganglion cells have all been lost, so there's no way that the rods and cones can communicate, communicate with the brain, but also the photosensitive ganglion cells, such as glaucoma, for example, acute glaucoma, you have massive loss of the inner retina. These individuals are now being benefiting from treatments that can consolidate sleep. So we can start to take Make an understanding. So, so, so give you a good example. A clinical ophthalmologist will explain what it's like to a patient with acute glaucoma, what it's like to go blind, but not what it's like to have this ghastly jet lag for the rest of their lives. So what I think these studies represent is what Oxford is brilliant at. And I have to say that I'm not a, an earlier number of Oxford. I moved my lab to Oxford seven years ago because these are the sorts of experiments, experiments I want to undertake. We had the fundamental, and uh, fundamental science, and we wanted to place it into some clinical context. And that's what we've been able to do. And as you'll see in a moment, working closely with clinical colleagues, we can then start to use the clinical work to inform the fundamental science. And when we talk about mental health, we'll see a great example of that. Oh, yes, and this was, <laughs> yeah, sorry about this. Um, this, is, this, um, this was um, an acknowledgement of, 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 of what Oxford has been able to do. Um, we, we got Social Innovator of the Year, and this is the, um, the Minister for Business Innovation and Skills. So here we have the government actually recognising the importance of placing fundamental science uh, into a clinical context. And that was a fun event. Uh, some of you may know Vince Cable. He's, he's a member of, I think, the, 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 um, the Liberal Democrats. Um, and, of course, their colour is yellow. And one of my colleagues rather unfairly said to me, well, clearly you won it because you were wearing the right colour tie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little harsh. Um, OK, so we've talked about the eye regulating the clock, regulating internal time. Let's now talk about sleep. This is where it gets a bit more complicated and, and as a result, I think, even more fascinating. The generation of sleep involves much, much more than just this body clock. If we think about the sleep-wake cycle, this profound sets of behaviours. The sleeping state, so very different from the wake state. Oh, and you may recognise this individual here, who's, who's very much, I think, in the wake state. Um, and of course, much of the time, we define the sleep state on the basis of an electroretinogram. These electrodes on the top of your skull, recording different sorts of brain activity. And as one de descends from the wake state through stages one, two, three, four, the, the amplitude of the rhythms increases and the frequency drops. And so you get this very distinctive pattern. And then you bounce up into REM sleep. The important point about this is that memory consolidation has now been clearly shown to be associated particularly with deep sleep, stages two, uh, three and four. Now, this is over a 60 to 90 minute episode. That's just one episode of about four or five throughout the night. So here's our 60 to 90 minute cycle. And we experience one, two, three, four, five of these every night. And you see that slow wave sleep dominates the first half of the night, whereas REM sleep tends to dominate the second half of the night. OK, that's a very brief description of sleep, both in terms of behavior and EEG. What I want to consider now is the new stuff. What's in this box, how it's generated, and how it's regulated. Let's kick off with sleep regulation. And I think this is where we have made actually some significant advances. So here's our sleep-wake cycle. And the first component is the body clock. When is the appropriate time to be awake? When is the appropriate time to be asleep? But that's not all. There's the intuitive part about sleep called the homeostat. The longer you've been awake, the greater the sleep pressure, the greater the need for sleep. And that's been associated, up, associated with the buildup of adenosine within the brain. Interestingly enough, why coffee, coffee works and caffeine drinks generally is because they block adenosine receptors. So even though you may have huge sleep pressure, if those receptors are blocked by caffeine, 
That's why caffeine makes you a bit more sleepy. So you then have these two, and in our society, of course, social behaviours such as the alarm clock, and in the business community that I talked about the other day, uh, talked about this the other day, and this, I think, is the primary way in which their sleep-wake cycle is actually uh, being generated, an imposition of the sleep-wake cycle as a result of an alarm clock. We should also mention stress is very important and also regulated by the body clock, but also things like pineal melatonin, this sort of extraordinary uh, hormone from the pineal that has been associated with changing levels of sleep. And again, we may touch on that. All of these structures, the master clock, as we've seen, is regulated by light, but many other structures, including this box here, are all being influenced by light, and in fact by those new photoreceptors. Those new photoreceptors are actually doing more than just regulating the clock. They're regulating our sleep propensity and levels of arousal. They're truly very important. To some extent, our light-dark exposure and our social behaviours will interact. Our social behaviour may well, may well drive our light-dark exposure. There's an intimate association, as we all know intuitively, of the sleep-wake cycle interacting with mood and cognition. We know how grumpy we might feel and how impaired we might feel after poor sleep. But also, and we'll touch on this later, an intimate association between mental health, mood and cognition, and there's, as I hope to convince you later, a fundamental mechanistic overlap, overlap between mental health and sleep-wake cycles. In addition, social behaviours will interact with one's mood and one's cognition. So the point I've tried to make is that what's impinging upon this box here is deeply complicated. Many, many interacting factors. Okay, let's now look at how EG, that behaviour we're talking about, is actually generated. Sleep generation. I have to say I, I get very excited with these slides because it, it's, again, one of the great achievements, I think, in neuroscience beginning to understand how many different brain structures and neurotransmitter systems in the brain give rise to the sleep-wake cycle. If we just, the details are somewhat unimportant, but just get a, an impression of the complexity here. The basal forebrain, the hypothalamus, four different key structures in the hypothalamus, the midbrain, two key structures, and in the ancient hindbrain, that bit that dives down before you go into the spinal cord, all of these different brain structures and neurotransmitter systems. They've all been vaguely associated with the production of alertness and sleep, but how? And finally, in the next cartoon, we've got a sort of a synthesis of what's going on. Our cortex, this great flap of neural tissue that sits on top of our brain, is being bathed in multiple neurotransmitter systems that keep us awake. The cholinergic systems and the monoaminergic systems. Note here histamine. Histamine, very important neurotransmitter that keeps us awake. So if you take those non-drowsy antihistamines, that's exactly what's going on. It's affecting the receptors uh, and those mechanisms that are regulating arousal. Now the wake systems, which are driving this great release of neurotransmitters, are driven by a tiny structure in the lateral hypothalamus. And it's producing orexin. Now, orexin has been linked with narcolepsy. Defects in orexin um, have been associated with narcolepsy, this, this tendency to fall asleep in the middle of the day. So, again, lovely connection there. That's what keeps us awake. What about sleep? Oh, yes, there's another thing. Very important that while we're awake, we're turning this black box here off. The velpo, the ventrolateral preoptic nuclei called by Cliff Saper at Harvard the sleep switch, and quite rightly so. Because once the Velpo is activated by those things like adenosine building up, it turns this lot off. It not only turns off all those neurotransmitters that keep us awake, but it actually actively turns off these neurotransmitters as well. In the same way, it also activates a bunch of neurons within the midbrain whereby you can get this oscillation between REM and non-REM sleep. Interestingly enough, it's in REM sleep that we have this muscular paralysis so, and, and the rapid eye movement of sleep. So you sleepwalk, not in REM sleep, because you're paralyzed effectively, but in non-REM sleep. And so I think with this, so this cartoon, really, we now have a, a beautiful schematic of our understanding of sleep. Why do we sleep? What's the point of it all?
Well, sleep is critical for cognitive processing, amongst other things. And many anecdotal sort of examples will spring to mind where you've had a night of sleep and you've solved a problem that had been pondering about for some particular time. We know this sort of intuitively. But Jan Born did a classic experiment um, a few years ago where he actually quantified that um, observation. And I just wanted to show you this data because it's so very elegant. What Jan did was devise a task that you could perform in an iterative way. One to two, two to three, three to four. And you could, you could complete this long set of calculations. Or you could get what he called insight. To say, hang on, I don't have to do all this. I understand the nature of the task. And jump to the right answer. What he did was introduce people to the task in the morning. This group performed it that afternoon. And about 20% of the group gained insight. This group, again introduced in the morning, performed it the following morning, but with no sleep. 20% gained insight. This group, you know what's coming, introduced in the morning, performed it the following morning, but with sleep. 60% of the group gained insight. And the point that Jan and many of us make is that sleep is not the brain simply turning off. Lots of important stuff is going on. And what these data show clearly is that if you want to come up with innovative and, and novel solutions to difficult problems, a night of sleep enormously augments that ability. So don't marginalise sleep. Sleep is not an illness that needs a cure. It's a fundamental part of our biology which we need to embrace. So three key points emerge. One is sleep generation and regulation utilises multiple brain structures and brain regions. Great triumph of neuroscience. This complexity makes sleep behaviour incredibly vulnerable to disruption. And that's what I want to discuss next. Sleep disruption is associated with multiple health problems. So we've done the neuroscience. Now let's look at the impact of disrupting our sleep. Body clock and sleep disruption. Well, the consequences of sleep disruption are now very well documented. And I have to say that reading this list, it does remind me a little bit of my teenage son. Um, <laughs> but that would be harsh and never quote me on that. Um, but let me give you an example. Drowsiness, microsleeps, unintended sleep. Classic study from a Swedish power station. 60% of workers admitted falling asleep once a week. 25% admitted uh, falling asleep four to five times a week. 15% of workers fall asleep at least 10 times a week. 33% of workers admitted that falling asleep had caused a significant error or near miss once a year. And I think this is the most interesting statistic. All five controllers were found to be asleep in the middle of the night shift. And they were being monitored, the EEG was being monitored. The researchers went in and they'd woken themselves up and they said, um, were you aware you've just fallen actually into stage two, three sleep? And they said, well, of course that was not perfectly fine. And that illustrates the huge and terrible problem is that you're impaired when you're sleep uh, deprived, but you don't know how very impaired you are. And that's why it's so dangerous. Weight gain. Some lovely data coming from colleagues at the University of Chicago. Let me explain this experiment. What Ev Van Kouter did was take healthy young males, allow one group to sleep four hours a night, only four hours, and another group up to ten should they want it. Then they looked at metabolic hormones after seven days, only seven days. Now, the hunger hormone, ghrelin, had leapt up by 28% gone up by 28% after seven days, carbohydrate consumption had been driven up by 35 to 40%. So, and correspondingly, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, leptin levels, which is the satiation hormone, had gone down by 17%. And so what we see here is that what you have in sleep, de de uh, sleep deprivation and sleep disruption is that the, 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 the swing is towards weight gain. Now, we've known this for years. Night shift workers tend to be obese. They also have higher levels of diabetes too. And what are the consequences of knowing this? Well, you know, what we should be thinking about is what do we feed our night shift workers? What, what they have access to is high sugar, high fat, all the worst possible things for the body to deal with. Knowing this, we should therefore think about ways of, of, of actually dealing with nutrition for night shift workers. In fact, I did meet a manufacturer of baby food recently. I said, you can make a fortune, just take the, the, the baby food um, wrapper off and stick night shift food on. You know, high protein, low sugar, and actually be probably very easy to digest. 
Okay, decreased cognitive performance, reduced ability to concentrate and remember. This is an fMRI study of a fully rested brain performing mathematical tasks. And you see all these lovely bits of the brain lighting up. And this is the same person after a relatively short period of sleep deprivation. Not a great deal of activity going on. There it is. And I think it's a beautiful illustration of how sleep deprivation can affect brain function. Just thought I'd throw this in, um, perhaps for our vice chancellor. Um, this is a lovely study showing years of um, doing long haul, greater than eight hour flights, um, on cognition compared to the ground crew. And you see that there's a significant cognitive decline in those individuals after four years doing great hour, greater than eight hour shifts compared to the ground crew. Um, also, what's interesting, and we'll come across this later on, is in those individuals had greater and elevated levels of stress hormone. And we'll talk about why stress hormone might be important in a moment. Now, the problem is that tired brains then get involved in increased stimulant and sedative use. And this is kind of a serious point. Your tired brain, after the alarm clock has woken you up, the first thing you'll, maybe the second thing you'll grapple for will be your cup of coffee. We've explained what caffeine does. It opposes those, those, that, that sleep drive of adenosine. So, and if you're really wicked, you'll have lots of nicotine, which again is a very effective way of keeping you alert. The waking day for many is fueled by caffeine and nicotine, but of course, they can last in the body for some considerable time. So you now need to go to sleep. You're feeling completely alert and perky. What do you do about sleep? Well, you then may resort to alcohol or sleeping tablets, which will actually acutely induce sleep, but it is not a biolog biological mimic of sleep. And so, in fact, one of those wonderful things we're talking about, some of the great benefits of sleep, will be impaired by this, in, this, this sort of essentially um, masked or induced sleep, the sedation, if you like. So you need more stimulants to get you going the next day, more sedatives, and this appalling stimulant sedative feedback loop, I think, represents the life for many people. And to give you a sense of of the reliance on coffee. After oil, coffee beans are the highest traded commodity on the open market, so I'm told. Another serious point is the increased use of stimulants and sedatives in our youth. It's been estimated that on average, children are sleeping perhaps as much as two hours less every night than they were in the 1950s. And Mary Kaskaden from the United States at Brown suggests that for full cognitive performance, a teenager needs nine hours sleep. Many are getting six or seven. And part of the explanation that people like Mary would suggest is that the increased use of stimulants during the day and, and sedatives at night are so, associated with that sleep, chronic sleep deprivation of our youth. Finally, reduced immunity to disease and viral infection. Natural killer cells are a really important component of the immune system are altered by sleep deprivation. One night without sleep has been shown to lower the activity of these cells by 28%. Part of the reason, perhaps, why night shift workers have higher rates of cancer and higher rates of infection. Night shift nurses, for example, greater rates of ca breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Why? Well, the one thing we know about elevated stress hormones is that they suppress the immune system. And we've got classic examples of elevated cortisol impinging upon immune function. Okay, so that was a rather sobering component about the impact of, 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 of clock and sleep disruption. Let's now move very briefly to the last, which is sleep disruption in mental illness. Just a few statistics from England, not the entire UK. 16.7 million people have some form of mental illness, going from the mild to the very severe accounts for 15% of the disease burden, costs in England 77 billion a year at least. We're interested in studying severe mental illness with my colleague in, colleagues in psychiatry. And what I mean by that is psychosis. Now, the definition of psychosis has varied enormously. So I want to just pause very briefly and give you a, a clear definition of what psychosis actually means. If we look at the general population and a series of traits the trait of paranoia and abnormal perception, the trait of anxiety and neuroticism, and the trait of mood elevation and instability. And across the population, it goes from essentially very low to very high. And what you have in this severe end here is illness 
And in terms of psychosis, it's around about 3% of the population who are severely ill. But what you also find, which I think is really fascinating, is that there's a fourth trait that we can add to all of this, which is sleep disruption. Again, sleep disruption is a trait that penetrates throughout the population. But in this part of the spectrum here, it's essentially 100%. This is illustrated by a paper that we just published uh, at the end of last year, it came online, led by my colleague Katarina Wolf, a great collaboration, looking at sleep disruption in, 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 in schizophrenia. This is the normal sleep pattern of an unemployed individual, nice and stable, hormonal patterns nice and stable, no social constraints on this individual, so they're remarkably stable. This is the spectrum of destruction you see in schizophrenia. It is absolutely appalling. In fact, this individual here, it's as if they had no body clock whatsoever. So you see that this is endemic in schizophrenia. And this is the first quantitative analysis of sleep rate disruption in this very prevalent condition. Now, we've known anecdotally that this has been around for ages. In Kraepelin's classic book on psychiatry, 1883, he talked about abnormal sleep. But really, from the 70s onwards, it's been largely ignored and dismissed. Basically, it's a byproduct of the antipsychotic medication. Absolutely madness, because this has been reported way before any antipsychotics were ever introduced. In the same way, and this is a genuine quote, which is what got me into this, somebody, I should say, who was not a psychiatrist at Oxford, but at another place, who said, my patients can't hold down a job, so no wonder they get up late, miss my clinics, and don't have friends. And so the whole thing has been completely dismissed and marginalised. So what we see, of course, is that features of sleep disruption and psychosis, it's extremely common, but has been largely ignored. We see three other traits, which I just like to familiarise yourself with. Poor physical and cognitive health. Actually, the sleep disruption precedes the psychotic illness. It's a, it's a risk, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a predictor of risk. And finally, if you actually stabilise sleep, you can have an impact upon psychosis. So, let me just very briefly show you. Poor physical and cognitive health, well, what a surprise. All the things that we've talked about in the context of disrupted sleep are endemic in mental illness, in severe mental illness. The cognitive uh, impairment, for example, the metabolic problems, the cardiovascular problems, all seen in mental health. The fact that the, 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 the sleep precedes the illness. And this is a lovely study that we, is unpublished, but it's with Guy Goodwin in psychiatry. This is the rest activity pattern of an individual who is at low risk of developing bipolar. Here's the high risk individuals, and you see that already the sleep wake pattern is beginning to break down. This individual is not bipolar, they're at high risk of developing bipolar. So here we have, for the first time, a really reliable early warning sign of this potentially impending disaster. And then intervention improves psychosis. Dan Freeman, again in psychiatry at Oxford, this is the level of psychosis before treating and stabilizing sleep. And you can halve the level of severity by treating sleep. And this is actually just a fairly mild treatment of sleep. We think we can do a lot better than that. So how are psychosis and sleep linked? What are the overlapping mechanisms? And this is the new synthesis that we published in Nature Neuroscience just recently. An abnormal pattern of neurotransmitter release is clearly going to precede you pre, 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 um, as a precondition for neuropsychiatric illness. But as we said, because the sleep and circadian systems draw from most of the neurotransmitter systems in the brain, if you have a defect here that precedes you to that, you're almost certainly going to have an impact upon sleep. When you start to disrupt sleep, you're going to precipitate activation of the stress axis, all of these problems, they're going to feed back, further destabilize this, further destabilize that, and slide you into that pathological state. Why I think this is really interesting? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, yes, evidence. I haven't given you any evidence for this. Another very recent paper, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll just talk this about this very clearly. So we a great theory, but how can we how can we provide mechanistic links? This is a paper that was, again, just published at the beginning of the year, looking at mouse models of these conditions. Now, you can't say that a mouse has schizophrenia, but it can exhibit certain features of human schizophrenia. And to cut a long story short, 
This SNAP25 protein has been strongly linked to human schizophrenia. So if we're right, and there are overlapping mechanisms between the mechanisms that predispose you to schizophrenia and those that give rise to sleep weight disruption, we'd predict that these mice would have abnormal sleep patterns. Do they? You betcha. Look at this. Here's the wild type, here's the activity, the rest phase, and in our mice, large fragmented activity with much of the activity in the wrong phase. They're running during the light phase, not the dark phase. What we've been able to go on and show is that the light input pathway is perfectly fine. The molecular clock is ticking away absolutely fine. However, we've shown that the way the clock is talking, its output signals to the rest of the body are brought forward in time. They're abnormal. As is cortisol, it's dragged forward in time, as is, as I've explained, the activity. So what we've now got is a way of burrowing in and looking at mechanisms, and we can link the mechanism very precisely. In this case, it's an abnormality with the way that the clock cells are talking to the ab output cells and regulating the rest of peripheral 24-hour rhythmicity. Why is this important? Well, I think three critical issues. What I want to do is provide a better understanding of the neural and the genetic mechanisms that are common to sleep, sleep-wake timing, and neuropsychiatric illness. A new approach to, I think, a really incredibly important area of neuroscience and health. Use sleep and circadian disruption as a biomarker in the early diagnosis of these conditions. Remember that bipolar data. If we take those individuals and attempt to stabilize sleep, will we take them off of that trajectory? We don't know. That's what we want to investigate. And then finally, use agents that regulate sleep and sleep timing for the reduction of symptom symptoms and for the improvement of the quality of life in many, many individuals with neuropsychiatric illness. Right, let me just very briefly talk about our new institute, the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute. This uh, was, 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 was terrific to work with my, my colleagues across Oxford and, and the neurosciences, and we were very lucky in receiving a major grant from the Wellcome Trust, and also uh, supported by Oxford University. Basically what we've got within this Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute are four linked to components. The first of which, which has been funded, the, the Wellcome Trust have funded the neuropsychiatric component, that bit I've just talked about, this new approach to mental health and sleep. What we're wanting to augment and build upon